they somehow think they're entitled to the votes of people who affiliate with their party rather than the idea that they actually have to earn them every election. And the downside of this is that we're stuck in a two-party, zero-sum binary in our politics where for one side to win, the other side has to lose. And that creates a really destructive governing system because there is no incentive to actually compromise and get things done as long as that you can perform and show your base that you're fighting for them, uh, results aren't actually the thing that matter. And we see that in policy across the board. And now I am pumped to welcome to Yang Speaks, the head of Unite America, an independence independent, Mr. Nick Troiano. But first, I want to preface this by talking about what I'm holding in my hand, which is a hardcover copy of my new book, Forward Notes on the Future of Our Democracy. It comes out imminently. Please grab a copy. And I say this because I know that Nick has been working his butt off for years on a lot of the things that I write about in this book. So it's appropriate that Nick joins us today. Thank you for being here, Nick. My pleasure. And thank you for sending me a manuscript of the book. I have it printed out in, in PDF version. And I tell you, it's hard to put down. So I, I hope those listening will do their jobs in order right away. It's a great work, Andrew. Congrats. Thank you, Nick. You would think so because a lot of it resembles your own experience. <laughs> oh, you're like, I remember doing that. <laughs> so we're going to, to regale listeners with your incredible career path where you were the young, one of the youngest congressional candidates in the country. You ran as an independent. You got tens of thousands of votes. What led you to do something so crazy <laughs> as, as a young person? Uh, well, that's a good question for us both in throwing our hats in the electoral ring. But when I was finishing up grad school, I was also running up, running a nonprofit in Washington called the Can Kicks Back, which was trying to get a bipartisan solution to the nation's fiscal challenge. And rather than pass any legislation to deal with problems for the next 30 years, Congress barely failed uh, in passing a budget back in 2013 and the government shut down. And it just became so clear that the country is going broke because our political system is broken. And I reached my point of greatest frustration and said, heck, if these folks won't get it done, why don't I try and do something different, not only running for Congress as a young person, uh, but also outside the two-party system as an independent? Well, Nick, what, what a high character thing to do because Americans were all pissed off when our government shut down then. And we all looked up and we're like, how the heck is this happening? And uh, I want to dig in a little bit to that experience of the government shutting down um, because I looked around me during that time and thought to myself, OK, like what is going wrong given that government employees are not showing up? <laughs> and uh, I know that there were some national parks that shut down. There were some other things that had problems. But part of me was like, it seems like these people cannot show up to work for a few days and then nothing really collapses around us. So that there was like a, there were, there were so many negative messages from around that time. Um, the first and most notable being that if you can't get together to even pass a budget, then how can we have confidence that you're looking out for the future? Yeah, there, there's, there's no looking after the future. It, everyone has a plan to win. No one has a plan to actually govern. And that, to me, surfaced all the challenges that we see in our electoral system about the perverse incentives that exist. And I'll use my congressman uh, at the time as an example, and this is why I decided to run for office. I, I'm, I come from Pennsylvania. We have gerrymandered districts. We have closed primaries. We have very restrictive voter rules. And so it was a moment of an epiphany realizing the congressman actually isn't representing all the voters in the district. He's representing the very few number of people who vote in the primary. And that's not what representative democracy ought to be about. Uh, and that's why at the time I thought the solution was, well, why can't we have leaders who aren't representing political parties or special interests, but actually all the voters? And I'll tell you, that message resonated across the district and across the political spectrum. In November of 2014, there were people working the polls on election day 
Green Party, Libertarian Party, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, just because we may disagree on issues. But I think one thing that unites us is a desire to have a functioning government, one that's even capable of solving our challenges. And so while on the surface, it looks like we're very divided in our politics today, in many ways we are, I think the one thing that we can agree on is that government that is supposed to be of, by, and for the people no longer is. How old were you when you took on that run? I was 24 and I turned 25 while campaigning. Wow. So you go back to your hometown in Pennsylvania, a great state, and in many ways the quintessential battleground nowadays. Uh, I drove through Western PA the other day, and I have to say the Western part of the state, you'll pass dozens, maybe hundreds of Trump signs. Uh, and then if you go to, to uh, some of the urban centers, then it, it gets blue very quickly. Um, but you go back there as a 24-year-old. That must have been a very tough sell in terms of saying, hey, the, the whippersnapper is back to run for Congress. What was your experience like and how did you get started? So I thought it'd be a tough sell. But when I said that I was running without a party and I wasn't accepting special interest contributions, I didn't need to explain much more to people to earn their support. And we ultimately ended up with about 13% of the vote, far from what we needed, but by orders of magnitude greater than many other independent candidates who've run for office because we bootstrapped it like you did in, in your campaign. Uh, and however, it also revealed to me the structural barriers that exist in trying to inject new competition into yeah. the system. Had to collect two and a half times more signatures to get on the ballot, right? Had to explain to media why they should even bother covering our campaign. Uh, had to think about how to raise money from individuals at $100, $200 at a time and not getting $5,000 checks from PACs because of the committees I sat on in, in Congress. So it was also a firsthand learning experience for me as to the barriers of why we seem to be stuck with the lesser of two evils in our country. And uh, that's my mission in the time since is, is how do we level the playing field and how do we fix the system? Have you gotten to the chapter in my book about running for Congress? Uh, I have gotten to the chapter on running for office generally, yeah. Well, there's one where I try and illustrate all the structural impediments uh, in, mm -hmm. in running for office, uh, particularly as a first-time candidate, and, and I know you ran into them firsthand. So now you're a 25-year-old former congressional candidate. Uh, what's your next move? I mean, you had first-hand experience uh, with what the institutions um, were and weren't doing and your story reminds me a little bit of Crystal Ball. Do you know Crystal? Mm -hmm. uh, so Crystal didn't run as an independent. She just ran as a, as kind of an anti-establishment dem um, in a very, very red district, if I recall. Um, but I, I find that people who run for Congress have a much more developed perspective of the process. Uh, and it, it's something that I love about your background and, and some of the other former candidates' background. It, it makes you uh, understand things much more viscerally. But... What did you pivot to next? Because at that point, you have a very interesting story. But uh, in, in my mind, it would be unclear how you go from candidate to reformer. My next move was in, in the course of doing this, I met a college professor named Charlie Whelan at Dartmouth who wrote a book called The Centrist Manifesto. And his vision was to create a third force in our politics that could elect a sufficient number of leaders to the U.S. Senate where they can actually could, could control the balance of power. Uh, and hopefully force the institution back to some problem solving. And I was inspired by that vision. I joined our board and within two years uh, decided to come on board, uh, replace our outgoing executive director at the time and, and try and bring this vision to life. And, and my uh, pitch to do that was to try and do that at the state level, to actually recruit and support a slate of independent candidates and build real infrastructure uh, for them because I saw the missing infrastructure when I ran. But it wasn't long before we reached the end of the 2018 election cycle when those candidates and others had lost that we concluded there weren't just large structural challenges facing new competition, but also large psychological challenges too with how tribal our politics have become and the lack of an identity for a third force. So we went back to the drawing board and eventually decided to focus on reforms to our political system that would not only level the playing field, but also improve the governing incentives for both major parties as well. Mm -hmm. 
Do you love coffee? Because if you do, we've got a new sponsor alert. This episode of Yank Speaks is brought to you by Trade Coffee. So when you're, if you're the type of person that goes to bed thinking about your next cup of coffee, or you're a crazy coffee nut, or you're just a casual coffee drinker, Trade's goal is to make every cup of coffee your best if ever. And it's a coffee subscription service. So basically, you go to their website, you take their coffee quiz, whether you like the French press, or the automatic drip, or a cold brew, whatever it is, you get the answer and Trades will pair you with the perfect coffee to fit your taste. They'll match your coffees you love from over 400 craft coffees and send you a freshly roasted bag as often as you like. They guarantee you'll love your first match and they'll replace it with your first, your first bag. They'll replace it with a different bag for free if you don't like it. So you can try this and you can give feedback as you sip. So if you like certain things and don't like others, you can improve what's coming to your door. So right now for our listeners, Trade is offering you your first bag free at checkout. So to get yours, go to drinktrade.com slash yang. Use the promo code yang. Take the quiz, start your journey to the perfect cup of coffees. That's drinktrade.com slash yang. Use the promo code yang to order your first bag of coffee free from trade. Enjoy it. So these are things that you learned the hard way, it sounds like, over the last six or seven years. Uh, and tell the listeners, what the heck is Unite America? Uh, you know, I mean, aren't we already united? I mean, that's obviously a dumb question because we're just talking about polarization. Um, but you say you joined the board and then you became the head of it. Uh, th- this is an organization that's promoting independent candidates and centrist ideas and uh process changes? That's where our roots have been in the independent uh, world. But I'll be clear that we have pivoted from that as an organization. And I have too in my own journey in political reform, which is to say that no matter if you think we ought to have many parties or just two, let's at least have some that can govern. And so creating a more functional and representative government is the mission of Unite America And the means of getting there is through nonpartisan electoral reforms that can empower voters with more voice and more choice in elections so that it is they who are deciding the outcomes and not narrow groups of more partisan voters in primaries or special interests that try to influence the process. So success to us looks like a government that's capable of solving the biggest challenges facing our country. And we're well on our way of trying to get there by changing the incentive structure of our politics today through these reforms. Well, the the biggest changes that we need, I think you and I agree on this, are open primaries and ranked choice voting. And they kind of go hand in hand because of what you just said. So you described the spoiler effect. And uh, I've heard a lot of this, even though it's been rumored that I'm starting a third party. And so all of a sudden, immediately people are like, oh, you're going to empower the bad guys and, and uh, the bad guys uh, in, in this discussion typically are the Republicans, at least among you know, de- Democrats. And so it's like, oh, third party intrinsically bad because uh, you're going to help the uh, other side win. Um, and so you need something to remove the spoiler effect. And it's interesting how conditioned voters are around the spoiler effect. Uh, it, 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 I feel like some, somewhere along the lines, uh, the Democratic Party or the parties generally have uh, just incepted everyone that it's like, ooh, other party. <laughs> like, uh, they, they somehow think they're entitled to the votes of people who affiliate with their party rather than the idea that they actually have to earn them every election. And the downside of this is that we're stuck in a two-party, zero-sum binary in our politics where for one side to win, the other side has to lose. And that creates a really destructive governing system because there is no incentive to actually compromise and get things done as long as that you can perform and show your base that you're fighting for them. uh, Results aren't actually the thing that matter. And we see that in policy across the board. If our political system actually rewarded problem solving, we still wouldn't be talking about immigration as an issue, or we still wouldn't be talking about what we do about climate. We still wouldn't have a $21 trillion debt. So that's the consequence of being stuck in a dysfunctional two-party system. doesn't necessarily mean a two-party system can't work. In fact, we've had one that did for a long time, but it's very difficult for it to work where we are today in our politics with how sordid the parties are and how the primary process uh, gives a disproportionate influence to the most extreme voters. 
I think that's a very key takeaway for everyone, which is that results now have no correlation to your electoral success. And you can see that in the fact that the U.S. is now ranked 28th in basic measurements like clean air and clean water, education, our life expectancy is lower than that of other developed countries, like really basic stuff. And you would think that if things are going badly, then you would vote the bums out of office, whoever the bums happen to be. <laughs> but but now the facts on the ground don't really correspond to whether or not you get voted back in. Congress has an approval rating of 26% and individual members have a re-election rate of 94%, in part because of the distorted party primary system that you're you're describing. And I was blown away, Nick, when I ran for president around the fact when I, I talked facts around, for example, eliminating 4 million manufacturing jobs over the last number of years, it just went in one ear and out the other for political figures, media. It's like that, that reality does not matter, except in so far as it intercepts with what's going on in the media uh, cycle of the day or... Uh, something that's going to inflame uh, a particular group on social media. <laughs> like, like, just facts have left the building and, and it, it makes me super sad. Uh, you know, one of the major challenges is trying to get facts back into the building. Um, but you can tell politicians are unfortunately now very quickly conditioned not to respond on facts. They're, res- they're conditioned to respond on communications. Yeah. And I think that's the overwhelming dynamic of our elections, especially in general elections, is you don't actually have to earn more than 50% support as much as you have to just convince voters how unpalatable the other candidate is, right? So Democrats say if Republicans get into office, they're going to take away your health care. Republicans say if Democrats get into office, they're going to take away your guns. And so just this is a feedback loop that cycle over cycle is what is helping to drive the polarization it is not serving the voters well, but to your point, it definitely serves the politicians well. 90% of them are getting reelected. By the way, it serves the interest groups that are raising money. It serves the media that is also earning money off of our clicks and eyeballs. So division has become the business model of politics today, in part because there's so little competition in the system outside of just one Democrat, one Republican in most general elections. One thing my wife, Evelyn, found fascinating is that our founding fathers were not fans of political parties and this duopoly we're living that everyone takes for granted. It's like, of course, there should be two major parties. But this situation is one of the nightmarish worst case scenarios for the founding fathers. Like if if you told them, hey, there are two parties that control everything, they would have been like, this is exactly what we were trying to prevent. Yep. I think Adam said it was the greatest political evil he dreaded under our Constitution. Washington warned of it in his farewell. And so if you're an alien descending to America and you read our declaration, you read our Constitution, you will not find a mention of political parties in there. You'll find three branches or separation of powers or Bill of Rights. The party system and how we do elections is not in there. We created it after the fact. And I think that's important for two reasons. The first is that uh, it doesn't have to be this way. It does not have to be this way. And the second is we can change it because the same we can Constitution change it. says... Preach, Nick. <laughs> this Constitution says it is the time, place, and manner of our elections is up to the states, if not for some act of Congress. And so the movement that I think we're seeing develop and that we need to fuel is this idea that we can change our electoral system state by state or through Congress that our government's actually responsive to the people. And that's, that not only is happening now, there's historical precedent for that. You go back 100 years, right? There was no secret ballot. State legislatures were electing senators. Women didn't have the right to vote. Corporations were giving directly to candidates. Those things changed because people who didn't agree with each other on policy joined together to say the system isn't working for any of us. Let's change it. And if they can do that at the turn of the 20th century, I think we can do it today with all the organizing power uh, that that we have. And and that's the task before us. That is the task before us, my friend. We're going to do it. You've been leading this charge for years. I am now going to be joining you. It's welcome. Yeah, it's the right struggle. Uh, It's the right struggle. Uh, We're we're going to raise uh, a movement, an army. Now, uh, 
when I was talking to Evelyn about this, I said, look, uh, the Democratic Party didn't exist when the Constitution w was written. It came into being a little while later and it was called the Democratic Republicans, which I thought was interesting for people. And then the Republicans were originally an anti-slave Northern Party, which I think now people would, would find somewhat surprising that came into existence decades later. Uh, so, and there were other parties uh, at, at different points um, before the GOP came into existence. And so right now, this two-party duopoly that we've been living with for quite some time really is just an invention. And it's an invention that made more sense pre-technology, where they were this filtration system, but now we don't need it as much. Uh, you should be able to reach people in different ways that you don't necessarily need just to have the D or the R, but the, the parties have made it so that politics has become much more about tribes than about policy. And this is something that a lot of, uh, of Americans, because they're into our, our media, uh, don't understand, which is that if you sit a conservative down uh, and say, hey, do you think drug prices are too high? They'll say yes. And say like, do you want to stick it to the drug companies and get those prices down? They'll say, they'll, they'll say yes. Uh, and obviously, you know, you get someone on, on the left, uh, you'd probably get the, the same policy stance. So why is it that these two people seem to regard each other as like the worst enemies? So one of the misconceptions that people have is that voters are voting on policy. But the truth is, at this point, they're voting on tribes. Uh, and to your point, Nick, what we need is a new tribe that people can subscribe to around these principles of making our government functional for us and saying that there's no reason why we need to have party primaries that make it such that 83% of Americans are disenfranchised in congressional races. And I think it was your organization, United America, that came out with a staggering statistic that 83% of races were decided by, was it 10% of voters? Yep. Yeah. Uh, we released a report a few months ago called The Primary Problem, and it looked at the 2020 election, which we celebrate as high voter turnout, 67% in the general election. But what most folks don't realize is that by the general election, 83% of congressional seats were already effectively decided in the primary because they're overwhelmingly Democrat or they're overwhelmingly Republican. So whomever the party's nominee is, is almost guaranteed to win. And then when we looked at, well, how many Americans actually voted in those primaries that had any kind of choice, the answer was just 10%. And so you have a very small number of Americans who are disproportionately on the extremes of both parties deciding the vast majority of electoral outcomes. And not only does that disenfranchise millions of Americans from real choice, it is distorting our representation and is fueling division in our politics. So if we want to fix our politics, we have to fix this primary problem. It's the biggest solvable challenge that we face in our democracy today. Real talk, folks. How's your mental health? I just had my therapy session with BetterHelp today, and they are our sponsor on Yang Speaks. And what BetterHelp is, it's not quote-unquote therapy or self-help. It is just personalized counseling done securely online. It's super easy. It's professional. It's secure. Uh, you can message your therapist at any time. It's fantastic. So whether you're talking about depression or stress or anxiety or relationships or trouble sleeping, for me, it's about figuring out what I want to do next every day, put one in front of the other, releasing some steam and thinking about the goals I want to accomplish in life and how I get there. You can use BetterHelp for everything. I have friends that use it. I literally preach this thing to everybody that can get uh, within earshot of me. And I know Yang does it too. You need to prioritize your mental health and BetterHelp is the place to go. And they're our sponsor. And right now we want you to start living, living a happier life today. So as a listener, you're going to get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash yanks. It's not a crisis line. It's convenient. It's professional, affordable. Anything you share is confidential. So join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash yang.
let's fix the primary problem. Uh, we're going to go after it. Now, one thing I'm genuinely curious about, Nick, because you've been in this space for a while, how would you describe the tribe of people that are into reforming the primary process uh, and our democracy? Like, like if you were to draw someone up, I'm going to describe you for just a moment because we, we know you a little bit. So you're like a young, upstanding <laughs> uh, professional who lives in Colorado, which is a purple state, very fitting. Uh, and you all get together large groups of people periodically. What does that crowd look like? Like who is in the movement now? I, I think it's a diverse cross section of Americans. You have people on the right who want to drain the swamp. You have people on the left who are upset about the corruption of money in politics. It is, it cuts across ideology. You know, some of these ideas like, hey, should everyone have a say in a primary, not just the party, the dominant party in the district, or shouldn't elections be decided by a majority of voters? 90% of Americans can agree on it. The challenge that we face is that we're surrounded by a media system, a political system that keeps us divided for their own benefit. Now, if we were to say, hey, now, Instead of dividing us for your benefit, we're going to unite for hours to actually try and fix the system. That's the tipping point that I think that a movement can reach to really be successful long term. And it takes the idea of people being willing to put country over party to realize that it's not the next election that is the most necessarily the most important thing we can possibly uh, be organizing around. It is what is this democracy going to look like over the next century if we can't get it to be more functional than it is uh, right now. And so I think we have to lay down our partisan arms, at least in this context, join with each other mm -hmm. and pursue common sense ideas that will put voters first. Uh, I love the sound of that, Nick. And one of the things that I'm excited to do is get to work on the state level. So what are some of the states that have a lot of energy around reforming the primary process so that it becomes open primaries and ranked choice voting. Yeah. So I, when we look at a policy suite that can address the problem, we're looking at how do you end partisan gerrymandering? So primaries aren't the only elections that matter. How do we expand the use of vote by mail in a secure way, which is shown to increase turnout and informed turnout among people? How do we advance ranked choice voting so that uh, winners of elections represent a broad cross-section of voters, have to. And how do we replace party primaries with nonpartisan primaries so that there's one ballot, all candidates run, all voters run? Those are the four reforms that Unite America is pursuing. And there's great momentum. Uh, in the last election cycle, at the ballot, uh, voters adopted an independent redistricting commission in Virginia. In Alaska, as you know, voters adopted the first final four voting system, which is a top four nonpartisan primary with ranked choice in the general election. And it's not just happening at the ballot. In this past legislative session this year, Colorado and Utah on a bipartisan basis voted to expand the use of ranked choice voting at a local level. 23 cities in Utah will be using it this fall. Uh, and we also saw Vermont on a bipartisan basis, adopt vote by mail in their election. So in different states, this is taking a bit of a different form, but together we see a rising movement of reformers who are trying to get an electoral system that can better represent the people and more states need to follow. And that's where the Yang Gang and others can uh, pitch in and, and get involved. We've been so grateful at United America to be able to mobilize resources to citizen-founded, citizen-led campaigns in states where a group of activists have come together, imagined something better, and put together a campaign that got it done. Um, we can do it. We can do it. And Alaska's success redounded nationally when Senator Lisa Murkowski was one of the few Republicans to criticize Trump, which is political suicide for most Republicans. Her approval rating in Alaska among Republicans plummeted to something like 15 or 20 percent. Uh, now, Alaska last year adopted an open primary, so Lisa does not have to go through <laughs> a primary process, which I'm going to suggest might have freed her to speak her mind where Trump was concerned. And one of the arguments I'm making to everyone is that if you change this process where people don't have to go through the party primary, you're going to see a lot of 
legislators all of a sudden become much more independent and rational. Getting rid of the party primaries can liberate our leaders to actually lead. And that is on the Democratic side. That's the Republican side. And that is leveling the playing field for new competition as well. When we look at some of the most extreme folks who've gotten elected, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Madison Cawthorn out of the Republican Party last election cycle, you run the numbers, only about 5% to 8% of the voters in their district actually cast ballots for them in the deciding election in their district. Wow. And so we have to shift the number of people who are actually dictating these electoral outcomes, because if we make it more representative, we're going to get not only better leaders, but those leaders are going to be incentivized to represent a broader swath of their electorate and finally be able to say, I can take this tough vote. I can reach across the aisle. I can speak my mind because it's not going to be 5% of voters in the district determining my reelection. I represent all the people. And I think for Senator Murkowski, uh, going, going back, she lost a primary in 2010 to a Tea Party challenger, but the voters in Alaska organized to write her name in on the ballot successfully in the general election, the first time that's been done for U.S. Senate in half a century. And as you hear her tell it, that was the moment where she viewed her reelection as uh, being able to represent this eclectic group of Alaskans who returned her to office. No longer was it the fact that she owed her election to just one party's primary voters. And so imagine if we had a Senate where we had a dozen, two dozen more leaders knowing that they don't just represent the five to 10% of Americans who uh, are are on the extremes of both sides. That is the vision that we're going to make real, Nick. And if there is someone who should get behind this, I'm going to just describe this for a moment. It's a Democrat in a red state where you know that your candidate has no chance. Uh, You know, you're going to be noble and put up a good fight, but you're going to lose. Or a Republican in a blue state like a place like New York, where I am, where you also are in the minority and your vote never matters. There's a party primary on the the other side and you're just finding out who the heck they're going to run. And then after it 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 makes it to the general, then, you know, your person's going to lose. You should be ticked off. Like people are getting locked out of the election system by these party primaries where by the time it gets to you, it's already been decided. What kind of democracy is that? And it's up to the states to change it. If enough of us get together, we can change it everywhere uh, and actually make it so that everyone gets to participate. Yeah, And that's what it's about. Uh, This isn't about some desire for moderation necessarily in our politics or splitting the difference between both sides. It's just making it work. It's better about better participation more competition. And when you have more participation, more competition, you're going to get better representation. And my feeling is if this country is better represented, we're also going to get better results to the challenges that we care about. This is small d democracy. And it's important that voters across the spectrum uh, join together to bring about uh, these changes. We have the means and levers to do so. One of the things that United America is focused on is it's also going to take resources and in the last election, there's only about $36 million invested in any reform campaign that was on the ballot in, in the country, in the entire country, $36 million. Crazy. That, that because how, much, how much is spent on uh, one side or the other trying to win? Six billion? 14, like that? $14 billion was spent last election cycle by both parties for, uh, for federal office. So, and so... Think about that, everyone listening to this. $14 billion on one side or the other winning. A lot of that's going to cancel its, itself out. And then only $36 million on the fundamental problems, which are pissing us all off. Yep. And, and so the, the case to donors, small donors, large donors, is instead of only fueling the problem, where does most of that money go? As you know, Andrew, 30-second ads convincing half the country about the other side being such a threat. I do like my ads, Nick. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Your ads were good. Uh, let's invest the money where we can fix. The- that was the problem, Nick. More millions of dollars into more ads with this face on it. <laughs> now, I, you know, I, I'd be very happy for all that money to go to actually solve the plumbing problems. Uh, so, it, again, you know, and, and um, one phenomena that I complain about is that according to the numbers to raise money from someone, uh, you have to alarm them. So we, we get all these alarmist emails where every day the house is burning down. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it's making everyone crazy. 
Yeah. Well, here, here's where our alarm is, and this is not and ought not to be a partisan issue. January 6th. January 6th was the 9-11 for our democracy. If there's anything that's sacred in our democracy, it's the peaceful transfer of power. And it was attacked that day. And it's sad to me that it seems some parts of our politics and people in it have sort of moved on. How do we move on after witnessing an insurrection at our capital? The, now, go back a few hours before the attack happened, and you have former President Trump stand on the National Mall and said that we're here to get our people to fight. And if they don't fight, we're going to primary them. We're going to primary them. And so, again, the primary problem surfaces as... He's using it as a cudgel to, to beat legislators into submission. So January 6th is our clarion call to remove the primaries from the system, not just because we care about solving you name your issue, but because we care about actually trying to save our democracy. If we continue in this doom loop, as some have called it, of polarization, and winning is the only thing that matters, then our governing institutions and our elections themselves become just part of the political game. And we're soon approaching a place in our politics where few people will accept the results of our elections, either because it's voter fraud on one side or voter suppression um, on the other. We can't let that happen. We have to hold some things sacred in our democracy, and our election system is certainly uh, one of them. Sports have long been an important and defining part of our history. With their impact and influence, key moments in sports have helped shape, heal, and inspire. It has been said that I have two alternatives, either go to jail or go to the army. But I would like to say that there is another alternative. That alternative is justice. I'm Doc Rivers, and I'm proud to present a new podcast documentary series called It Was Said Sports, where I guide you through six of the most impactful and timeless speeches in sports history. The question has already been answered. Should we be here? Yes. Listen and follow It Was Said Sports, a documentary podcast presentation of Shining City Audio, a C-13 Originals, and John Meacham Studio. Available now wherever you listen to your podcasts. I've got a vision to pitch you on, Nick, that I'm sure you've thought a lot about. So this is my phone. I, I manage a lot of my life on it. Uh, I transfer um, information uh, and money in different ways. And... One thing I hear all the time is, why can't people vote on their phone? And I feel like there are two major impediments. Number one is technological, where people are concerned that it would be hacked or fail in some way, uh, or uh, people uh, would somehow find out about how everyone voted. Uh, and then the other is the nature of the party primary process that we've been talking about, which is that uh, if you are a party, and if you look into this, no one on either side has embraced mobile voting, uh, even though you would think that at least one party might think, well, this might help me because more people will vote. Um, but neither party has been into it. And they've pled all the time that the tech's not ready for prime time. But the technology is getting better. And you'd have to say at some point it will be ready for prime time. I have friends who are working on it and insist that uh, it's at least pilot ready now. Uh, there are folks in the blockchain community who say, look, um, in principle, we should be able to do this pretty straightforwardly because if you tamper with anything in the blockchain, obviously, you know, it, it's immediately evident. Uh, so one of the visions I'd like to pitch Americans on is we should be able to vote on our mobile phones. There should not be this ridiculous stand in line at our local gymnasium uh, and have it be that people are somehow disenfranchised and locked out. And I'll say, too, I ran for mayor and I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, hey, I want to vote for you, but I needed to register as a Democrat four months ago and did not do so. So now I can't vote for you. I mean, that, that's another. And, you know, you'd think like the Democrats would be like, oh, you know, we're all about everyone voting. It's like, well, you're not into anyone who's not a registered Democrat four months ago <laughs> voting. 
Um, but uh, to the primary message around mobile voting, shouldn't we be able to vote on our phones the same way we manage the rest of our lives? I, I think the point that you're driving, which I agree with, is our entire election system is outdated. And now's the time to be thinking about how do we move into the 21st century? Even when you consider why do we vote on Tuesdays, that goes back to the 19th century when we needed to allow enough people time to get from wherever it was where they were farming to the county seat to vote and back again by market day. I mean, we we take certain things for granted because it's always been that way, but there ought to be and there are better ways of doing it. And I think when it comes to mobile voting, there are pilots happening. And that even includes for overseas and military voters that some states are starting to experiment. That's with. the only one that, that's gotten approved because right. overseas military, everyone's like, well, that makes sense that that's the only way they could vote. Right. But I, I think one thing that we have to do is uh, ensure that we maintain trust in the system, both in reality and perception. And right now, as you know, we, we have a crisis of confidence just in the way that our current election system is held, in part because of how polarized these issues are becoming. Now, there are some states that are doing it right, Kentucky among them, where there has been bipartisan support for increasing voting access, such as number of days for early voting, as well as for increasing voter security, such as uh, being able to verify identity on a mail ballot through signature, through government ID. And these things aren't mutually exclusive. We can have a more accessible and more secure system, but unfortunately, our politicians are now using this issue as another wedge issue to mobilize their base, again, because of the way that their primary system works, democracies become in the crosshairs. So are you right now optimistic, pessimistic, some combination? Because you talked about how the movement's been growing, and I want to grow the movement very, very significantly. I think that there's no other way out. Uh, you know, I, I looked at the map and the math, and uh, it seems to me that uh, so th there are people out there who think, well, the Democrats have demographics on their side because the country is going to be growing more diverse. And so eventually Democrats will win out. And if you have that as your belief, uh, then I've got a couple of data points for you. Uh, number one is that last year, Democrats lost 13 House seats uh, when they thought they were going to win five to 10. And so demographics in theory should have been helping because <laughs> has, you know, time had passed. Um, but the other thing is, is the way our uh, electoral college uh, and map work out, um, you're going to see people in less populated states be consistently overrepresented, um, and that's not going to change. So if you have a diversifying population, um, that doesn't help you do anything other than run up the score in certain states, unless those people were to move in mass <laughs> to, to Wyoming and North Dakota and a bunch of other places, uh, which they're not going to do. So well, what you see ahead by the numbers is polarization going up and up because all the incentives are around polarization going, going up and you see two sides that are going to be gridlocked and deadlocked and uh, unable to get much done. Um, it's going to get worse and worse. There is no path back that doesn't involve some sort of systemic reform like what we're describing that changes the incentives, makes it so that you actually get rewarded for being reasonable, you get rewarded for being human, you get rewarded for being independent, and you don't live in fear of the 17% most extreme voters in your district. Uh, and then have, by the way, leaders who can then use that 17% to beat you over the head if you... Uh, say anything that they disagree with. Yeah, I, I think reform is thrown around as a term by people who have different ideas of what it means. T to me, it means how do we reform the system so that we're better capable of bridging our differences to get to better outcomes in the public interest. Reform isn't how do we manipulate the system to make it easier for a narrow majority to bludgeon the other side into submission. Because my fear of that approach is that it will only accelerate our division, and we are staring at the prospects of actual political violence if that trend continues. We're seeing it, 100%. We're already seeing it. So if we want to accelerate that trend, that's the direction to go. If we want to actually turn down the temperature and get to a system that can represent a large, multiracial, diverse society that we have, we need a political system that can give better representation to more groups of people and actually kind of incentivize coalition building and problem solving. 
And that's what this set of nonpartisan reforms that I've been uh, talking about can help lead us to. And by the way, the reforms that I've mentioned sit at what is the nexus of what is possible to achieve right now and can be impactful. Hopefully that Overton window shifts over time and we can be talking about more ambitious reforms uh, d- down the road. So this is a movement that will and needs to continue to build. And to your question, I am optimistic about it. You know, right after my campaign, Andrew, you asked me before, I, I, I thought I would try and find support to champion these reforms in Pennsylvania. And there was no one interested in it, no one funding it, no one wanted to be part of it. And so uh, I wound up going in a different route. Today, it's different. We, we, are, we and represent us, have uh, created an accelerator award where people can start a campaign and apply for funding and support. We had more applications than we knew what to do with uh, when we opened it up because people are joining this movement and it needs to be leader full. There, there isn't about one person, one ideology. We need many people getting involved and leading these campaigns at a local, state, and national level. And I'm seeing that more now than at any time over the past uh, decade. One of the things I hope for, Nick, is that we can make this movement positive, optimistic, solutions oriented even fun, because I think right now most people are really tuned out on politics for decent reason, because it's exhausting, it's depressing, it just makes you more angry and frustrated. Uh, And there's a real need, I think, for uplift. Uh, I mean, the the world is not doing well, the country's not doing well, our democracy is not doing well. Um, But (laughs) all of that said, it's going to take a lot of people coming together to change it. And I think that that can be fueled by anger and frustration. Yes, that there's some of that. But hopefully it can also be fueled by hope and uh, optimism and positivity and universality. Uh, and that's what I want to inject into it. Uh, I, I want to build a, a really exciting movement. And this is one of the problems we have is that if I run around, uh, you know, I'm actually going to say too, um, I became well known for running on a thousand bucks a month for everyone. And that's something that most everyone can understand. Um, if you say, Hey, open primaries, some people understand it. And some other people are, like, you know, um, so what, one of the challenges we have is to try and make this translatable and uh, relatable and relatable to people. Um, one of the arguments I'm going to make is that if you want something like universal basic income, it's going to be much more likely to have it happen if representatives in the government are actually responsive to the people as opposed to narrow subsections of people and very special interests. Yeah, I I would go one further, Andrew, and say if we want our great American experiment of self-government and the longest living constitution in the world to endure, we're going to need to make some serious changes to our politics. And it doesn't need to be doom and gloom, to your point. There's something special that our, we don't need permission from the political establishment. We don't need permission from the parties to actually go out and do this. It'll take people running for office and getting elected on this platform. And it, and it will also take, in half the states that have it, us utilizing our direct citizen initiative processes too. That's part of the secret sauce that has led uh, America to be resilient over now close to 250 years, which is that we don't have a perfect system, but we have the tools to make it more perfect over time. And I'll tell you, when I ran for office as a 25-year-old against a system that looked like it was intractable and immovable, going out to collect 7,500 signatures from fellow citizens in my community and then sharing the debate stage with a sitting U.S. congressman was an empowering experience for me in getting involved. And so I think for all the reasons why we think the system is stacked against us, let's realize who actually has the power. Uh, in the moment that we do, as the American people, I think we will overcome. You know, Nick, I had such a similar experience on the presidential trail. I'm, <laughs> Did I'm you? Like the, Tell me. I'm like the you. Well, you know, just, you know, I was on the debate stage seven times with Joe and Bernie and uh, Kamala and everyone else. So you're like, hey, you know, and I, I was just a guy. <laughs> so, so, so hopefully we can build on that. Uh, thrilled to be your companion in this movement, we're going to do something really amazing and profound. You know why? Because it needs to be done. And as long as we can actually show it to enough Americans, they'll be like, oh, yeah, that's totally what we need to do. 
Uh, and that's my job. That's your job. Hopefully, that's the job of everyone who's listening to this or watching this today. Nick, love your new book. It's called Forward. Notes in Our Democracy, uh, The Future of Our Democracy by Nick Troiano. Seriously, like, like, I, I mean, well, yeah, I'm joking because I seriously think that Nick could have written this book uh, and uh, we would have had a lot of the same takeaways and substance. Uh, Unite America indeed, man. We, ha we have a lot of work to do, but uh, I'm inspired to be joining you. Your organization's great. Your community's great. And we're going to grow it like mad. Uh, Andrew, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for taking on this next challenge together. And thank you for the Yang gang that's out there that knows there's something better in our politics. We don't have to stick with the status quo. So I'm excited to work uh, with you on this important endeavor. Who likes the status quo? I mean, that's one of the things that just blows my mind when people are like, yeah, you're like, you really think <laughs> things are going well right now? Like, who's into What's going on right now? Like nobody. So, you know, it's like, hey, we're going to do something different. Be like, oh, thank God. Thank God that they're going down a, a different inclusive road that everyone can join. Indeed. Thank you.